a burgeoning field is the field of resistance to immunotherapy. So, Caroline, can you tell us much about what we know about mechanisms of resistance, either primary, meaning to your initial treatment, or acquired resistance after stability or response? So you mean to immunotherapy or yes, to, to both? Yes, uh, usually to PD-1 blockade. That's what I think so most of the work's done. Yeah, it's true that we should not uh, focus only on the responders because we have actually a, a lot of patients who do not respond and a, and a lot of patients who, uh, who relapse. So we are faced to uh, primary or secondary resistance. We have uh, read uh, in the recent years some very interesting data on patient samples showing that even in the field of immunotherapy where until now where we were mostly interested in the microenvironment, the, the cells that were present here or not and thinking only about some more cellular at the cellular level but now we see that at, at the genetic level in the tumor cells we also have genetic events that can actually be uh, the reason for the resistance. And uh, Tony Ribas and then was the, uh, really the pioneer to show and to publish that some mutations, either in the interferon gamma signaling pathway, JAK mutation, uh, or also mutation in the beta do microglobulin, some protein, I mean, some genes coding for protein involved in the immune response at the level of the tumor cells could be involved in the resistance. So I think it's very interesting because once again, it shows us that we should be really keeping our eyes really open and not consider that we treat with targeted agents, so the resistance will be genetic. And we treat with immunotherapy and the resistance will be like lymphocytes, microenvironment. It's, it's always the same problem and we have to consider, I mean, it's not the same reasons, but we have to be really to take into account the wide spectrum of all resistance mechanisms that can occur. That said, um, it's interesting, but we cannot rely on that uh, for the clinic because uh, it's not a very frequent event. I don't think that if we screen our patients for JAK mutation, we will find, I mean, it's, it's quite rare. It's just a very big step forward in understanding the mechanism of resistance, but it's not the only one. And plus, we also have read some data in, the, in, in Cell and in other journals saying that a good and a functional interferon gamma signaling pathway could, so in the opposite, lead to secondary resistance because of the emergence of other immune checkpoints that were going to be expressed. So, it's complex, but we progress. So what would provoke you then to switch therapies? Let's say you're on a PD-1 blocking agent. So Michael, wh what provokes you to switch treatments and what would you switch to? If you're on a PD-1 blocking agent to start with and then a patient progresses, my first question is, is do I believe that this progression is an isolated progression or do I believe this is more of a systemic progression? And so what do I mean by that? If I have a patient on a PD-1 antibody and overall their tumor burden is generally controlled, but now all of a sudden they have a new lesion somewhere pop up, sometimes I'll think about just surgically resecting that lesion or irradiating that lesion or treating it with some other type of local treatment, thinking that maybe the PD-1 drug is keeping the whole body in check, but now we just have one problem child and we're going to deal with that with some kind of a local approach. If, of course, there's multiple areas of progressive disease, then I don't think that the PD-1 drug is being effective, and that's when we would think about drugs like ipilimumab. It remains a question as second-line treatment, do you give drugs like ipilimumab alone, or do you give a combination and stay on PD-1 and then add another drug like ipilimumab to the mix? That is a subject of ongoing randomized trials, so we really don't know the, question, the, the answer in that question. Ideally, hopefully, we would get to a point as we're talking about biomarkers where we could biopsy a progressive lesion know what the mechanisms of resistance are within that tumor or tumor microenvironment, and then devise a cocktail to a patient to then administer some additional drugs into the cocktail so that hopefully to bring them back into response. So maybe you give a PD-1 drug, it progresses, you biopsy, there's a lot of IDO expression in the tumor microenvironment, and you wonder maybe this is why they're not benefiting the PD-1, and 
and then you can add an IDO inhibitor. This is just an example of some thinking of trying to treat patients, ongoing tweak immune of, uh, of immune therapy as we go based upon different biomarkers, either in the tumor microenvironment or the peripheral blood. We're not there yet clinically, unfortunately. We're still at a point where we're just trying to understand some of these basic mechanisms, but I think that would be kind of a fantasy world where we ultimately would like to go. Would anybody re-biopsy patients to find out those sorts of data and act on them, or do you think that's still in the investigative realm? Reinhard? Well, I, I have to admit that we do a lot of biopsies, and uh, I think we have to learn, and we try to expand our our immunohistochemistry repertoire. So we do PD like and one testing. We do we just uh, count the T cells in the, in the tumor. We we uh, sometimes we we do uh, molecular analysis for interference signaling. Uh, we stain for for uh, pigmentation genes, so uh, uh, proteins. So there's a lot of things ongoing, and I think we need to learn. I think the major problem is that we have is that you need to assess everything simultaneously and put this in large databases and and get an algorithm established that is clinically useful. And for this, I think we need close cooperations with between us because we. Nobody can collect the data by himself, and we need medical bioinformatic persons who, who can uh, uh, help us to deal with, with the data that we, that we uh, collect. Mm. Okay. So, Axel, it sounds like some people are doing biopsies, some people are uh, using their gut feeling. Um, when you have the problem of uh, knowing that a patient has a BRAF mutation, what are the criteria that you use to decide? Are they rigorous criteria? Are they seat of the pants criteria? Are they just talking to the patient to decide whether to give them the immunotherapy first or the targeted therapy first? Do you have criteria? Yeah, before we talk to the patient and, and uh, you know, discuss the various options, we are uh, having a board discussion. So there's different opinions sometimes on the same patients, whether to prefer tyrosine kinase inhibitors or immunotherapies. This reflects the situation how biased we are, you know, because there's no clear-cut criteria. The speed of the growth of the metastasis is of importance. There's no doubt about it. It is a tumor load. We are looking at the LDH still. It's a biomarker, and the only one which went to, a, paradoxically, you know, to HECC classification. We have no other biomarker, and I would love to look in the future also on mutational load and other secondary uh, uh, resistance mechanisms and we have a clinical trial which is called Logic 2. It's biomarker driven so once you have a progressive disease uh, the uh, probes are evaluated and certain uh, patterns are uh, evaluated and then you know it's it's driven by the mutations which are detected. So that's I think something of, of great interest but uh, it's also the personal situation of the patient. Once a patient is not willing to travel every two weeks, every three weeks to our center and to be treated with, with oral drugs at home, you know, preferences and so on. But in our center, honestly, 70% of patients prefer immunotherapy once you explain the options. But very many uh, are critically discussing toxic toxicity of EP nivolumab and nivolumab. 